and that those people still do matter and we don't want to lose humanity for efficiency. Well, thank you for that, Rachel. So what I want to start out with is um, a pretty simple question, but might have uh, an, an interesting answer, if you will. Um, so my, my question to start is, what were your top three challenges in starting your business? Okay, my top three challenges. I think these have actually grown over time. So my first challenge in starting a business was when we just started, I had no idea how to start. And there's not there's lots of online blogs that say, go to LegalZoom or go here or go to this website and they'll help you and they'll help you. Um, but there are, as a computer engineer, there were so many things I didn't even know to ask Google for. I didn't know to think about when I hire a remote worker in a different state, oh yeah, I have to go get their Department of Revenue number so that I can pay the unemployment in this state. I, di I didn't think about how to pay taxes, um, what other implications business laws and practices have on my small business. I was just worried about how do I help you advance your technologies. So I think one of the biggest challenges were how to know what I don't know for starting a business. Um, and this is where I really have loved um, the National Small Business Association and other mentoring communities and, and things to help you know, one, how laws affect you and how you can change laws to help grow your business, but then also um, work from someone that's done it before to help you grow and scale. So that, that was the first one that definitely was hard. The second one, we are a fully remote business here at Skill Dev. So hiring, nurturing, and managing remote work was... Um, I did it at, I, I had practiced and, and experienced doing it as a worker, but doing it at this scale was not something I was prepared for. And it, um, it definitely was a little bit more challenging than, uh, I, I gave it credit for off the, off the bat. I can understand why there are a lot of businesses saying they don't want to get into the remote workspace because it takes extra time to make sure you're bringing that people aspect together, that you're building that trust that doesn't natively happen because you don't see each other at the water cooler, because you don't walk around next to each other in the hallway. Um, and that really is an important aspect of building trust and scaling a company. So that managing remote workspace was um, one of my challenges. And then the third one, and I don't know that I have a solution for this one, it's, it's our current challenge right now. Um, I was a business that was built out of necessity. As I mentioned, I couldn't find a job and so Skill Dev was born and then we scaled. So the simple definition of what do I do is still a challenge for me today. And, and it's hard because you want to, I, I balance this. I don't want to miss out an opportunity to help someone with defining what I do. Um, and, and so I think that's the third one that I would say is was a challenge for me in starting a small business. That's wonderful. It's um so it sounds like those three challenges alone could be the topic for a good how-to book. It's uh maybe well, that's the next opportunity challenge. <laughs> there you go, another opportunity, right? I think uh, probably everyone that is is joining us today could has a lot of experience as they say when life hands you lemons, you make lemonade. I think small businesses make lemonade every day. So, um, Rachel, I'm curious if if you had to say that there was one thing or one area that I wish I knew to date, what would it be or where it, do you have a continuous learning curve or, um, again, still sticking kind of to the challenge area because there, there yeah. lies the opportunity. I think the one area I wish I knew to date um, was a little bit more about sales and marketing in a business and how impactful that actually is. Um, I was thinking about it just from the technology perspective and, and how the actual service center, but especially as we scaled to having multiple employees and multiple people relying on me for their day-to-day income and and the food that feeds them at night uh 
needing to have that kind of sales cycle and sales pipeline, I had no background in that. So I feel like if, you, <laughs> if you're getting started with an expert in sales, you're, you're off to a much better start than I was. Um, but it's definitely, there are so many opportunities out there to learn, to grow, to scale. And even day, in this day and age, um, there's so many how-to guides on, on social media for free that you can help really scale this up. That's a good point. I know that's an area that I, I'm a continuous learner in, especially since a lot of the work I do is more in the quiet side. So um, with very little social media interaction, I will say this, I mean, I've learned from Molly and uh, Patrick and Ian and others at, at NSBA just on, on what, you know, is is some very good outreach. And um, I don't know if I'd call it sales so much. I, I think it's developing relationships for business opportunity. Yeah, so. that's a great way to put it. Well, and I, I think I personally, when you hear sales, it feels too cold. And so I really like that you say developing business relationship. That makes it feel better because that's really ultimately what at least my goal is, is to just help people and build those relationships and grow. Um, and even utilizing, we haven't mastered utilizing social media for external communications, but using it to learn as a learning tool beyond Google has been a, a huge tool for us. That's great insight. So I would, I guess, say too, as, as you're kind of navigating this path of growth and opportunity, and you've added people, it seems, every year from our discussions, right? Um, how would you see going forward? Like, what are what are your challenges? I think you've touched on some of them, but really to be able to grow and scale, what would you see as, you know, some pathways up the mountain, if you will, um, of, of growth and success? Yeah, I think um, this year we're definitely looking to uh, we, we hired a lot of people um, within the first couple of years. And this year, we're really trying to make sure we're aligning where people want to grow with where they are in the business. So I always go back to people and um, knowing that they are they are going to be how I grow this business to success um, is, is the people that I implement. And so wanting to make sure that I'm also building the business to serve the people that I have or give them the opportunity to say they no longer want to work with us. That's fine too. But, um, but I want to give them opportunities within our business. So right now, our next challenge is how do we align with where our team wants to grow into? So um, we've got one wonderful individual on our team that's really striving to get more into that pen testing space. And it's looking at how can we shift our business to really drive more pen testing opportunities to grow and scale him and then grow and scale that piece of our business as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question, but essentially I'm looking at it from people to structure to scale. So trying to combine people's interest, attention, that also meets retention goals, right? Because People are your most valuable asset, I always believe, right? I think we share I, I that. I definitely believe that. Right. So uh, with a lot of potential growth strategies, right? Yeah. Okay. And if it doesn't work, then what do you do? Um, then what we do is we help them find an opportunity that does. We've had a couple of people that it just hasn't worked out. It's not a fit. It's not a merry. Um, it, it, it doesn't work. It's not a, a great relationship for either one of us. And they're usually very sweet and we do our best to help them find an opportunity. I mean, I don't kick them out right then <laughs> there, you know, they're still willing to work with you, but we, I choose to mentor them out the door in the nicest way possible to say, I want to help you find this opportunity. I'm going to use my network and our network, and we're going to find you what you want, but we know that it's not a long-term relationship. And I think honestly, being able to openly talk about that with yourself and with your staff, um, it, it also makes it nicer when the transition does happen because everyone's aware he wasn't super loving it here. He didn't, he wanted to grow. This is really the opportunity that makes him happy. And it always, it builds your trust with the people that do remain. Um, so that's how we handle that. That's good insight. I know one of the things I always have as an expectation in any role I've had is that people are going to outgrow their job description. Yeah. And if they don't, 
then maybe they're not in the right spot, you know. So um, that that's kind of something I kind of look at a little bit of a garden of opportunity for them and for the business itself. I can so, say uh, one last thing to add on that. I actually learned this from working with some overseas developers at one point in my career. Um, in Romania, they have a three month transition period. Um, and you actually have to give three months notice to your to your business. Um, and that's to have the smooth transition. So I basically have taken the, if you know you're looking, like let me know and let's start this three month period and help each other out together um, to, to build that sustainability in that business. So that was a stolen idea from <laughs> Romanian a great one. We'll say it borrowed, right? Borrowed. So, great. Okay. So um, I think what we're going to do here is I think Nick is trying to get to a location with a little better connectivity. Um, but I first want to address it. Does anyone have a specific question for Rachel? You can either put it in the chat or if you want to use the raise hand option, maybe can call on you. Um, so yeah, thank you, Joni. And if I may, I'm sorry to pipe in here, but I have a question uh, that was sent to me from my cousin in South Korea who just made specialist. Um, so we're, we're very proud of her as a, as a family, uh, as an army family. Um, now she, again, as I said, she just made specialist uh, in the US Army, and she has a little side hustle, excuse me, side hustle via Etsy, uh, if folks are familiar with the online kind of e-commerce platform where you can sell little handmade goods and that sort of thing. Um, and she was as a current service member or, or as a family member or spouse. Um, in moving around and, and kind of navigating those difficulties and what Rachel, I guess, has that meant to you in terms of owning and operating a business and putting people first with the challenges that you have yourself have, have faced? Uh, yes. Um, and thank you so much for that question. I moving has been moving and I, I'm going to add childcare have been the two that I guess are personal challenges <laughs> that affect the business um, that even now we moved to this location that I'm standing at right now from our previous post only days ago. Um, we are actually still in the middle of a transition of a military move with boxes everywhere and the joy and the hardship of a remote opportunity is the work doesn't stop when you move and outside of this wonderful, amazing community, I don't think the world understands what it takes to move your family across the, across the country or outside of the country and how long it goes through to uh, how long it takes to actually feel settled um, and, and everything in this space. So I am very thankful for having my own business and the ability to move and, and get to a new location, but still feel like I have something for me and we're not completely uncentered in needing to find a job and completely start over um, and allow myself to continue to grow. So a lot of military spouses and, and service members, as you move and you need to start over with your side hustle or your current job, um, it, it halts your ability to truly grow a full career. And um, so I, I do love the remote work that COVID has made more possible than, than ever uh, at this time. And uh, uh, sorry, I'm getting stuck in the chat. <laughs> we'll go to that in a second. Um, but yeah, definitely love it. Uh, I hope I answered your question. It's it's an amazing opportunity and it I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I actually was doing work during the move on a hotspot in the passenger seat of the car on the way to our new base and location. And uh, I was so thankful for that opportunity. So Rachel, you you bring up a, a really good point. I'd like to get one of our um, participants question in here. It says, as the family goes through PCS, do you need special locations or licenses per location? Or you mentioned a little bit on kind of getting to know, yeah. putting in so, on your experience. For my experience and my company is completely remote based. And I actually, as a 
tech company. We don't have any, we're unlike teachers, like we don't need a license per state for our business. However, I do need to register my business in every state that I do live in. So I have to go through the business registrar's office of the state that I moved to. You have 30 days from the day you move in to actually register and say, hey, yes, I am operating a business in this location. Um, and that's only needed for the business owner from actually hiring people, um, you just need to let them know that you are employing someone. You don't actually need to register your business. You need to register your business with the Department of Labor and the Department of Revenue, but you do not need to register your business with the, um, the actual business bureau. So Rachel, if someone wanted to um, hire military spouses, for example, it's, it seems like a somewhat underemployed and available um, actually, yeah. as I understand from the White House, it is the most, um, the biggest group of workers available, the unemployment rates over 22% um, of any other constituency in the United States. So how would someone go about reaching out to potential spouses or others vis-a-vis -vis around a military community? I honestly find the easiest way to get military spouses is to join the military spouse group or a really close-knit group of people. There's a lot of organizations around military spouses looking for remote work. Facebook groups are where I have found some amazing people that I have brought into my business personally. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I strive to help people that had a similar opportunity or excuse me, similar struggles that I did. And so I have I first seek out the military um, spouses and, and those transitioning out to see if there's opportunity to help them. And, and Facebook groups and LinkedIn have been the biggest um, success that I have had in, in trying to hire those organizations and those people. And I will put a mini plug. They're some of the hardest workers because they really do appreciate the opportunity that you give them. Okay. Um, so do we, we can kind of talking about from also the communities of interest that you've worked around is mm -hmm. any observations um, of transitioning veterans or you know service members transitioning into um, business any guidance or you know tips that you would say in either finding a home in a small business i.e as a you know for experience and as an employee or to start their own small business? Yeah, I think one of the, one big tip that I have that I think everyone gives is don't be scared to use your network. Um, that is a great tool that you have and especially being a military member, service member, spouse, uh, wherever you are, you actually need a lot more people than you give yourself credit for. And it's not usually your direct network, but it's usually your network's friends that have and help you get the opportunities, whether that be additional contracts to scale your own business or employment for you within a small business. Those are some amazing underutilized skills. And I know personally for me, um, it felt like I shouldn't be using my friends for that, but you'd be surprised how willing people are to just help uh, and support you in those areas. And then, um, oh gosh, the other trick and tip I'd give you is don't be afraid to tell people what you're doing. Um, you know, post about it on LinkedIn and say, look, I'm doing this. Uh, even if you haven't created it yet, look, I want to do this. Um, and you'd be surprised the people that raise their hand to help out. Uh, it's, it's an incredible community. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, I was going to go to Bill next. I just want to do a Nick check and see if he's on the line with us. Nick, did you get to a you, connectivity? Joni, you got me? You hear me? We can hear you. <laughs> so you're the unknown we number go. here. Welcome, Nick. There we Thank go. you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, and I, I had to jump. I was up at Duke all day. Sorry for being late. Uh, connection. I didn't, I didn't check the network. Uh, at Duke, and so I, I just expected being at Duke, I'd, I'd have great service, so I apologize. No worries. Well, we thought you were in some remote location somewhere around the globe, so um, 
I guess that's the case at, at Duke University here in North Carolina, but uh, we'll kind of dive right in. Nick, we were um, asking everyone, Rachel just gave us a little brief background on um, herself and her company is if we could start with that and then we'll dive into the three questions I want to ask you. A little bit on your background. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I've been a career soldier uh, living in special operations and recently came off of, uh, of the operational teams about a, about a year ago to focus on uh, some, trying to solve some of the harder problems that I felt uh, needed a little bit more attention around really the, the divisions of labor in the defense market across uh, academics, commercial capital, and, and DOD. Um, there's not a 101 class on how to scale into the defense market. So set up a new cell and uh, basically incubated a, a group of us inside of our, our command to, to focus on these hard problems, which are really centered around people. So that's what I do now. Um, in doing that, I learned a lot, a lot about um, ideation, commercialization of your ideas and uh, entrepreneurism and uh, started applying some of those skills I was learning to um, to a new venture for my wife and I, um, who has uh, incredible, incredible uh, cookie recipe, which um, is like no other. I know a lot of people probably say that, but uh, we literally have our employees sign NDAs um, because of this recipe. And then we uh, mixed in some intrinsic value and created a cookie company called Kind Cookie Company. Um, and uh, it's centered around community. So without, without community, it's just a cookie. Uh, and through that cookie, we create agency of change um, right here in Pinehurst, which is our flagship store. And uh, we have a few few different ventures off of that. Wonderful. So Nick, um, kind cookie and um, your kind of journey in, in starting that. I guess my, my first question that I also shared with Rachel was if you had to reflect on your top three challenges in starting your business, can you give us some thoughts on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, top three that come to mind immediately is time management. Um, this is this is my my morning. So this is like me getting up before I go to work and, and then coming back and, and, and working on this um, while my wife is doing this all day uh, when the kids are in school. So time management is the biggest one and getting really hyper-focused on, uh, on, on, you know, the, not only the product, but then the mission, right? And then the connection. The second one is is resourcing, and the third is strategy. Strategy has turned out to be uh, the greatest challenge, but the greatest uh, gift now that we are on the right track. And we're we're six we're about uh, about eight months in to this journey. Okay. Wonderful. So, if you had to maybe identify or kind of corral the one thing that you wish you knew along this journey so far, the one thing that you think would have been, could have maybe compelled you forward a little faster, a little quicker, a little better, what would that be? It, that 100% was our brand strategy. 100%, no doubt about it, our brand strategy, because the brand strategy really brought out that purpose statement for us and the vision statement, the mission statement, our brand values. You know, it's, it's, how we fit in with our, our consumer and the problem that we're trying to solve. And so everything that's like in, in the military, that's our azimuth, right? That's the, that's the problem that we're trying to solve and, and our, our true North. And um, we had a really good idea, but it wasn't until we, we, we sat down and had some assistance flushing that out through a mentor that it created um, a whole bunch of dominoes fell after that. So I'd say that was the number one thing. So Nick, let me just kind of piggyback off of, of that thought as well. So on your brand strategy, how much plays into that vis-a-vis -vis you as a small business? You talk about community, but how about the small business identifier? Is that an asset? Is it part of the brand? Um, kind of share thoughts on that. Is, is the, are you asking, is the brand strategy... Um, can you can you explain a little bit more what you're questioning? Well, it's is we're a small business organization, right? And small businesses yeah, yeah, are the yeah. foundational bedrock of the U.S. economy. So, does yeah, yeah. the small business identity play into brand strategy? Oh, 100%. Yeah, 100%. I mean, 
um, it's, it's, I look at small business um, and the model that, that we're moving forward with um, as that, that, that keystone and cornerstone to the community. And like we envision um, our company, you know, really fitting into a world where neighbors, right, are, are empowered, you know, to purchase through purpose and connect and create change. Um, for the betterment of our communities. And so that is small business, right? And so um, it's really important that as a small business, we identify, um, you know, what are those values um, that others are going to adopt as we as we grow it and look to scale across the uh, United States and, and the market that we're, aim, we're aiming at. Um, I think I think you can hold on to those, those fundamental traits even as you scale um, because those are your roots. Uh, and those were the people that we're going to connect with. So, so Nick, I would say, going forward, um, what do you envision as you know top challenges? Where would you need help? Where are you looking for some additional wisdom, guidance going forward? Yeah, great question. I think I think going forward for us, the biggest thing is um, understanding. You know, I, I, banks don't like small businesses. That's what I figured out real quick. Um, and they they are asking and looking for a whole bunch of stuff that takes a lot of time. Um, and so um, that's something that we're not really interested in. So we're looking for investors. And so understanding um, what that looks like, you know, how to do that properly, where um, we, we do our first round appropriately um, that meets our need and the needs of our investors uh, is probably first and foremost, the mentorship on that, and then the mentorship um, on our strategy and, and how to scale from there is, is pretty important to us. Um, you know, my wife and I don't come from this background, and so we're learning we're learning and trying to use our networks and our, our networks of networks to, um, to move forward intelligently. So I would, um, well, first of all, I can certainly attest to kind cookie is extraordinary. And um, it's once you, you taste one, it's hard to go back. Or as my kids say, uh, mom, we like Nick's and Aaron's um, cookies better than yours. So they are extraordinary. I, I will <laughs> say that. Um, so before we turn it over to Bill here, I'd like to give a chance for maybe Rachel to ask Nick a question. Just uh because our, our, our two narratives here today is, is Rachel, um, any thoughts for, for Nick? And then I'll turn it back to Nick. Any questions for you? Yeah, Nick, I guess I'd, I'd love to understand a little bit more about what, how you're approaching the investor conversation as a small business. Um, I think that's just been a really like, where did you start or what was your nugget of information that you're like, this changed my life about how I approach investors in that space? Because I mean, definitely hitting similar walls on our side. Um, and it, uh, you have a little bit of advantages. You have physical space. And so you have a little bit more collateral than than a cloud-based business. But you know, I, do you have any nugget of insight that I can steal from you? Yeah. Yeah. So for us, um, really driving into that network that you had highlighted, right? And um, those different degrees of, of networks off of your, your friends and family, um, it was recommended, right? And, and when we started to um, play with the numbers and look at the time that it would take to scale, if we, because we started off self-funded 100%, um, and we looked at how long it would take us to achieve our goals and, and what those numbers were and the data that, that was being provided, we realized quickly that you know a simple bank loan was was only going to get us so far, and so um, it was really our mission um, and the vision that drove us to say if if you want to scale, it's you're gonna you're gonna have to give up some equity or you're gonna have to take a note right and, and then and then give a give a healthy return on and like what the what the current market looks like, and that was something that we were willing to do based on the numbers that we were going to be able to produce with that that investment, meaning you know, the equipment, the payroll, the people that we were looking to bring on, um, the marketing teams, you know, those types of things and talking to um, folks in the community who've already done this in different, in different markets, we realized quickly that um, it brought down our risk a lot to do this um, and was, 
we, we, we realized that those numbers were very capable of meeting that return. Um, and so we felt comfortable to move forward really and, and not, not be so scared, kind of removing the fear out of it, if that makes any sense. One follow-up, did uh, you said you felt very comfortable, but I didn't understand. Did you go the route of a larger payout or did you go the route of equity um, if you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, we're, we're, we're doing a larger payout. We want to hold on to as much equity right now. Um, and also, um, you know, we're still working, working through this. Um, but the, the payout was, was what we are, we're moving forward with right now. Um, it's all a friends and family round. And we decided that, um, <clears throat> you know, we would be reluctant or our families and friends would be reluctant if we didn't give them a chance. And what we told them was, look, who wants to invest in this? Uh, with the with the uh, um, possibility that you'll lose all your money, right? Um, and so we we uh, we decided to go with that approach. Um, and and I, I mean we're not asking for a huge amount, and it's it's pretty diversified. So um, yeah, we think that was that was the best route right now. Before uh, and we'll offer equity later on, probably if if this continues to go to the right way and scale. I think I have a question from our team here on the, uh, the call today that um, relates to, to, to your comments and, and Rachel's question. It says, when you approach investors, are you approaching them with the strategy of you will pay the investors when you sell your business? So do you have that glide path of a exit strategy already in mind, even as you're getting started? Or, you know, how I think you've touched on how you communicate with potential investors or, or friends and family around. But, um, you know, basically, you know, without equity, there's got to be a sell, right, at some time and space. Yeah, yeah. So they'll, they'll hold equity until we, we, until we pay them back. Um, we're looking at five years um, based on the numbers right now that we're turning. Um, the, the good thing about cookies is, and sugar is that it sells. And especially when you have a good product, um, and so far, based on our the current data, we we expedite we ac expect those numbers to uh, probably be returned before five years. Um, this area is is not my expertise. It's actually a friend of ours who who takes care of this for us. Um, we we've actually has been quite incredible in just asking people saying, hey, we need help with this. We we actually have a lot of volunteers who help us um, in this without even asking for any return, just because they want to. They want to see us succeed, um, and we have said, you know, when we get to a better place, like being able to afford their services is something that it's almost like an IOU. So we weren't scared to ask, and people weren't scared to help. Um, the worst they could say is no, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Nick, do you have any quick question for Rachel, and then we'll, we'll transition over here to Bill? Any um, thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, Rachel, I apologize, but I was trying to get on the call this whole time, so I did. I missed your whole conversation. I apologize, but um, I don't have any questions at this time because I missed it. Okay. Well, one thing you both touched on at one point, I'd, I'd just like to share from my own personal experience, and I think it also leads into to, to Bill's discussion here. I know one thing at, at three different stages of, of you know my journey is that mentorship has been really, I think, my force multiplier. Um, you know, for me is is to be able to, to, to this day, when I really have a, a either a major presentation or a hard conversation I need to have, to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation and saying, so here's what I'm thinking or here's what I'm going to say, and to be able to be a good listener, to really then be quiet and listen to that mentor and um, hear a different way, you know, to, to approach something or to hear, try this approach or, you know, maybe these words or so. It's, it's not that you take everything verbatim, but that, that wisdom to me has been my force multiplier. Sometimes it, it, it um, sharpens an edge in the right way. Other times it um, really polishes something up. And um, that's why I, I think we've been so excited about NSBA starting this mentorship program. And um, one of the, the key people, to my fellow trustee here to make that happen is uh, Bill Belknap. And Bill, I'm gonna turn things over to you and 
we've heard some different perspectives and what can you share? Well, sure. So a quick introduction, I'm a 20 year army retired. So my perspective is gonna come from a, a retired veteran uh, entrepreneur. Um, I was uh, 20 years in the army, as I mentioned, armor um, and uh, served in uh, Germany um, with a tank platoon and then a tank company down at Fort Stewart, Georgia. Uh, then after that, I went to uh, join the Army's Acquisition Corps for the last 10 years of my career, where I was a contracting officer, also worked in the tank uh, program office. I served in Turkey at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Ankara, Turkey, uh, before uh, um, final assignment in the Pentagon after being a general's aide um, for, for a couple of years. So from that perspective, um, I immediately went into corporate. I did corporate for 10 years with a large uh, pharmaceutical company. Uh, via networking with a, a former boss. Um, and then I had an opportunity to take a package and then to start my own company, which is something I'd wanted to do for a, a long time, having been a reader of Forbes Fortune, Inc., uh, entrepreneur, et cetera, for a number of years. So I, I, uh, as, I Jody, would it be helpful to start off with some of the three uh, three questions that, that you had mentioned, some of the challenges, sure. or just, just describe sure. the company? I would okay. be be happy to just um, kind of same three, which is the first one was, what were your top challenges when you started out? Sure, sure. So uh, I'll, I'll let you know that uh, my company, Energy, we do construction for uh, the federal government. Uh, our main customers are Veterans Affairs Medical Centers, and then we also do some work with the Department of Defense. So as far as uh, three challenges that, that uh, when I first started out, which now is about uh, 11 years ago, uh, started the company in 2012, First of all, was um, having started a company from scratch was being able to clearly articulate uh, your value proposition. What it is, what it, what are the uh, services or the uh, experiences uh, or the products or services that, that you can bring uh, that are valued would be, would be valued by your, by your customer. And uh, for me, it was harder than than it sounds. But one of the ways that to help me overcome that and be able to clearly articulate my, my value proposition now is by attending um, uh, some uh, veteran uh, pitches, some veteran um, Shark Tank competitions. And let me tell you, when you're in front of an audience, uh, you want to be on your A game. You want to be have studied a little bit uh, so that you can, uh, you know, tell tell them what what product or service you're you're offering. And one of my first ones was with the Greater Philadelphia Veterans Network here in Philadelphia, where. Uh, they had started a, a shark tank and i was one of the first uh, contestants uh, in that before uh, my company had ev uh, any re revenue that certainly helped me uh, clearly articulate my my value proposition the second one was access to capital and i've heard that discussion with with others and uh, when we started you know i was uh, probably uh, i was in my late 40s um, and uh, my wife and i teamed up uh, husband and wife a partnership 51% uh, 49% ownership and uh, I think she probably had 150,000 uh, bucks that she could tap into on her credit cards. We uh, didn't want to certainly uh, tap into that, uh, but, uh, and then I probably had 100,000. So the reason for my telling the story is that when, when I went to the bank to get uh, a line of credit, um, even though we had that amount of money on our credit cards, um, the, the frustrating thing uh, about it was um, the uh, uh, you showed all your references, what uh, your experience uh, had been in your career, and we were offered fifteen thousand dollars to start our construction company, which wasn't going to go very far <laughs> at all. So, um, one of the things that that drove us to do was to to uh, seek um, service contracts, which did not require a significant line of credit. Uh, number one, and number two was uh, with uh, uh, in seeking service disabled veteran owned small businesses uh, opportunities um, that paid net 14, uh, we would put on our subcontracts that um, subcontract uh, uh, vendor, we would pay you net 30. So we would get paid net 14. And then once we received the money, then we would pay our, our uh, subcontractors uh, net, net 30. And that still is in existence uh, today. But I'm, I'm proud to say that we've significantly uh, increased our line of credit uh, with our construction projects and pursuing uh, several million dollars worth of, of construction projects. Um, and so that, that, has, that has worked out quite well for us. And, and the last thing I would say is, um, uh, you know, getting um, 
with federal government contracting, which is what I do, um, be, uh, having been schooled in, in, in uh, contracting and a, a free reduced military assignment, was getting re-greened or re-educated on federal government best practices. And there's an enormity of opportunities to do that. And most all of them are free. So uh, the SBA offers free government contracting courses. Uh, the uh, Service Corps of Retired Executives, or SCORE, offers free um, counseling and mentorship on starting your business and federal government contracting. In fact, we have a board of advisors um, instead of a board of directors where we pay them, we have a board of advisors which uh, pro bono help us with our with our uh, growth of our company. So it's another opportunity. And certainly I would uh, not uh, last, uh, certainly not least, but and, and not last is a NSBA, which uh, NSBA has helped to uh, us to get involved with other business owners, network uh, on best practices, seek opportunities, seek relationships, and uh, certainly um, and helping formulate policy for us in particular. You know, when COVID hit, we were doing construction for uh, medical facilities. Well, medical facilities stopped our construction projects. Uh, uh, at March of, of 2000, our revenue went down 90% immediately. And understandably why the, 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 uh, the medical centers had to look at the unknown um, patients that they might have um, and focus on, on how do we work through our, our uh, country's crisis at the time. But uh, with policy, um, NSBA was a proponent for the PPP program. Um, if you're not familiar with that program, it uh, provided initially a loan, and then it turned into a grant um, based on um, if your business was shut down to a certain uh, uh, point where you would pay your individuals, you you pay yourself, you pay your individuals um, uh, a, a, a salary. And that was a bridge for us to get to when that finally lifted and we could resume our, our, uh, our government contracts. Excellent. So I would say um, if there was one thing that you, if, if someone kind of prefaced the one thing you wish you knew to date, what would that be? Maybe a tripwire, maybe some opportunity. If there's one thing you wish you knew, um, for example, Bill, for me, I always thought that I had to go find people in this little narrow niche that I'm in to get counsel. And what I learned along the pathway is a lot of times people with the diverse different types of businesses had the same problem or the same challenge. And often their perspective, their different perspective was, you know, fueled my opportunity to be able to navigate through challenges. So, so that's one thing I wish I knew earlier is that I didn't have to stay just in a, a, um, a tight vertical, if you will, and seeking, you know, wisdom, guidance, or experience. So Bill, sure. any thoughts for you on that? Sure. So, um, you know, with the federal government contracting in particular, especially the, the larger contracts, it's multidimensional, multidisciplined. And uh, the, the one thing that, or that uh, was extremely helpful for me to realize, uh, I guess two things. Um, one is a little bit uh, um, uh, about uh, perseverance and grit, which is you know, uh, uh, to never, never quit, always find a way to overcome obstacles. Um, and one of those things with government contracting is um, with your value proposition is you, know, you read the statement of work, you read the solicitation, and wherever you can't meet part of that solicitation, seek another partner. And there's numerous ways to seek another partner through, you know, uh, uh, searching the internet or searching uh, uh, trade organizations. And I'll just give you one example for me. Um, uh, one, uh, there was a boiler that needed to be retubed at uh, a, a nearby VA medical center. Um, it was an opportunity. I'd done large program management and worked on the, the tank program as an example. So I felt very comfortable managing a large uh, project. However, I did not have the experience for retubing a boiler. Um, so I uh, went on the uh, the trade organization, the National Trade Organization newsletter about, uh, uh, and, and uh, through networking there, they said, oh yeah, you want to contact this individual? They're, they've been doing it for years. And, and, and so I, I got out of my chair, got in my car, went to, went to them up in Williamsport, uh, Pennsylvania, LNL Boiler, 
and they were am amazing. They were, they were tremendous, and they absolutely wanted to partner with me, provide the technical assistance while I managed the project, provide the, uh, the site superintendent to do it. Awesome. Excellent. So I'm, I'm just curious in, in the sense of going forward. I mean, you've scaled your business now, um, have really, a, I think, a, a, a good uh, success stretch along the way. It's, you know, continued growth. What, what's the future look like? What are the, some of the challenges and opportunities forward for you? Well, so we, we have some uh, decisions to make. Um, for, for number one, um, in, in my business, we are looking for uh, the uh, major task order contracts for VA uh, medical centers. And those uh, MATOX are for five years and they are uh, uh, five or six companies are, are selected for that over that stretch. And they have exclusivity to bid on uh, construction projects um, at that location. So uh, for us to scale, to get bigger, it's to, to pursue more of those uh, major task order contracts. And here in Philadelphia area, we are target rich with VA medical centers. So we're very uh, happy about our position and the opportunities in the future to, to, to grow from that. So Bill, one of the questions we had were getting certificates or certifications important for your business um, as you started to scale and grow. Sure. So I don't need any particular licenses. Uh, you know, I've been asked uh, uh, for those before. In running my business with the federal government contracting, I don't need a state license. Uh, I don't need a, a trade show license necessarily, um, but uh, uh, I think that uh, what what uh, what I do need, you know, for if I want to pursue uh, veteran set aside contracts, is I do need to be certified uh, as a service disabled veteran on small business, and so that's uh, that's a process that you can go on the VA website. You can get help from numerous organizations, uh, NSBA. Uh, we'll, we'll help you with that. Uh, another organization I'm, I'm on the board, National Veterans Small Business Coalition, they can help you with that uh, that process. But that's that's a, that that's a opportunity um, because those who go through the process will have uh, have potential for tremendous upside on on the other side of it once you get your certification. The other thing I will tell you is that there's a true dynamic right here and now because the certification process is switching from. Uh, the VA, which has the gold standard, to the SBA. And so uh, uh, what I'm hearing and seeing is that of the 14,000 SDBOSB certified uh, um, uh, veteran-owned small businesses currently, you're probably going to see a couple thousand that are not going to want to uh, go through the SBA certification. They've, cert they've self-certified before, so you can see opportunities where they're going to want to sell their business. That's an opportunity for veterans. Uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition to buy those companies, those that want to divest of, of, of their companies. Uh, but it's a, it certainly presents a, a opportunities to, to either do that or uh, to go through and, and get your certification and, and pursue, uh, you know, government contracting. Wonderful. So um, I think in, in kind of wrapping up this section, I'm going to turn this over um, to Patrick here in a minute, but uh, just one last quick one for all three of you, for Nick, Rachel, in Bill is I'd like to know what's your hope for your business forward? The hope, the opportunity, hope is not a strategy. So what would you aspire for your business forward? So quick minute and then Rachel, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, and this, this is my hope and my dream. I hope I scale my business large enough that I can offer military spouses an additional leave package to support PCS moves to get their family settled, as it does take weeks of time and attention just at home. And the hardest part is not wanting to lose your salary or your, your financial income and, and still marrying that with your family. So that's my hope and my dream for me. Yeah. Your hope? Yeah, um, yeah. My my hope is to um, to to stand up our our nonprofit side um, for um, for the cookie company, so we can greater assist uh, military spouses and, and and children with special needs. Uh, a training lab 
um, so that we can teach them how to be bakers and, and some of the other skills and then and then grow the grow the company to put it at different um, military installations across the US. Thank you. And Bill, your hope. You know, I uh, I had a Normandy of assistance in getting to where I am today after 11 uh, going on 12 years. And I can't always uh, pay back the individuals that helped me. A lot of mentorship, um, uh, et cetera. So my goal uh, is to continue to do two things. One is uh, um, incorporate the best practices, um, also to delegate um, uh, some of my responsibilities, which will free me up to pass it down. So my, my mission is to help other veterans start and grow companies, particularly in, in the federal market space, um, so that's that's my goal and that I'm going to continue to pursue. So um, my hope is that, uh, like you all, I have had some really marvelous mentorship along the way, is my hope is that I can inspire a little bit, plant some seeds, you know, kick in some curiosity and um, really share different opportunities, but also to be there for the hard times when you don't know how you can make payroll, you don't know, you know, what's next, that there's somebody that can sit next to you um, and, and or listen or to, to be that person because um, all of us go through it at, at different times. And, and so that's my hope, my first hope. My second is I have, um, over the course of, of the last many years, I have been involved and in, in been blessed with some leadership positions in, in a lot of different organizations, but I truly mean it from the bottom of my heart that NSBA returns the greatest value to me. Um, sometimes I feel that's almost selfish, but um, I find any of our events where people are together and um, sometimes from as I said, very different business models, but people make a difference. And, um, you know, with that, I would just say for any of our friends who are not members um, to, to please take a look and, and reach out and talk to Patrick or Ian. And uh, we want to, or Molly, I apologize, uh, invite you in. And to those that are, um, I really look forward to seeing you at our um, maybe our Washington presentation or at, at some gathering in person. So come over and find me because um, that's important. So Patrick, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Joni. I appreciate it. I noticed a lot of folks on the webinar today are part of our, our leadership council. And we noticed that uh, veteran-owned business owners make for, make for great leaders. I think to be successful in business, you got to be a good leader. And I think the veteran military background provides that kind of training to do that. So we're, we're really happy that uh, you guys are members. And if, if you're not a member now, we, we'd love to have you as a member. We want, we want active folks. We don't want you to just pay dues. We want you to reach out to your member of Congress when there's legislation pending. Uh, we need you to talk to regulators when, you, when we need you to talk to regulators or do action alerts uh, when we ask you to, to do that. And a lot of our members do. And and that's what we want is active and, and engaged members. Uh, and we, we understand, you know, building our leadership council, we, we got a lot of veterans and we, we understand that they have some unique challenges. Um, some are less experienced, some are more experienced. So we, we developed a, a mentor protege program for our, our members through our veterans network, which you can join on our, on our website. Um, and as Bill mentioned, you know, there are some unique uh, advocacy issues that we're looking at that, uh, for, that veterans uh, uh, are important to veterans, like the whole certification process with SBA taking over that. Uh, are they doing a good job? We really need to keep an eye on that because we're, we have some concerns. And there's a, a lot of, like Bill said, check the box folks who say they're veterans and maybe they are, maybe they're not. But there has to be a good verification process so that actual veterans are getting these uh, these contracts. Uh, we're also partnering with a number of groups to expand access for our, our veterans firms to, to get contracts with larger corporations. Uh, so if you're not a member, you know we will be sending you out an email with information about um, how to join and, and get involved and, and be considered for our uh, leadership council. And I, I do hope to work with you all in the future. 
So I will turn it back to Joni. Thanks so much. Folks, we have, um, I think, about two or three more minutes. If, if there are any kind of follow-ups or connects, if you want to put um, a note in the chat, um, I think uh, Ian will, will keep that record and, and try to cross-pollinate people or connect. Um, but I just wanted to say, first of all, it is um, really an honor to be able to help kind of through, you know, walk us through this conversation. I hope you found it useful. And um, as I said, I'm looking forward, if I can be of assistance or so, I think we all are in an, a time when educating and informing is an important part of any aspect of our business. I can uh, speak personally to, uh, I started, I was an early cyber gal, if you will, and, and Rachel's expertise is outstanding and, and the service she's providing is, um, is really critical to, to returning value to your business. Nick's cookies are responsible for a larger part of me than I'd like to admit, and um, <laughs> they are uh, extraordinary. Um, but what I, I, I love is the foundational aspect that his family is uh, not only continues to serve the nation, but continues to serve the community and give back. And um, that is something I have found through my friendship with Bill and his guidance and mentorship and, and some others here on the call that I can see or see your names. Um, for that, I am deeply grateful for your service and for your friendship and um, looking forward to the next time we can all get together, which um, hopefully- Looks like Bob, Bob Schmidt has a question or a comment. I'm sorry, Bob? Yeah, um, I'm Bob Schmidt. I'm the founder of six different companies and um, I'm a disabled veteran and just wanted to spend a, a couple of minutes, you know, expounding on Rachel's uh, comments of, you know, who are you when you start your business? And it's very difficult to get focused initially to be able to say, this is who I am and this is what I do. Um, one of the comments that I got from the guy who started Medtronic, which is now the world's largest medical device company, is that he showed me his business card and the back of the, his business card and everybody in Medtronic has their mission. So, you know, to think about the mission and I start this with a little bit longer term of the tombstone ad of what is it you want on your tombstone of who you are. <laughs> now that may be too far for most of us, but it's a way to be able to start to think about it. So then the question is, what do I want to be in 10 or 20 years? You know, what does my company look like? And think about that a lot. And, you know, almost certainly it's going to be too aggrandized that you won't make those kinds of things. But when you think about that and start to focus on it, it gives you the ability to say, okay, these are the things that I'm going to work on for my company. These are the areas that I'm going to work in. You know, I'm going to do this, but not that. And those are very important thought processes to be able to go through as you start your company. Because you've got to remember, companies are just like kids, okay? No matter what you want your child to be, it's not going to happen almost certainly. Because they're all going to come up with their own thoughts and do their own thing. And companies will do the same thing. Because the first thing they have to do is follow the money. And that was one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got from my mentor of, okay, Bob, you're now the president of your company. What is it you do? And I went on about all these things that we're creating and inventing and doing other things. And he kept saying, no, 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 Bob, that's not it. And then I try again and basically to say the same thing in a different way all over again. And he goes, no, Bob, you don't understand. Your job is to collect checks. That's the only thing you have to do. You have to collect checks. So now what are you going to do to make people open up their wallet and say, you know, I want what you've got more than I want this cash in my wallet? Because that's your job is to convince them that, you know, the money, which is very attractive to them, but what you've got is even more valuable. So those are some thoughts to think about as you start your company and focus on what it is you're doing. How do you make that, you know, the group of activities of what you're doing 
more valuable than cash. That's a tough, tough road to hoe. But that's what you've got to do when you start your company. So those are a few thoughts that I'd pass along. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. That's excellent. Okay. Well, I think, um, Patrick, we're kind of bumping up against our, our time frame here. So um, any concluding comments? And if not, we'll wrap up for the day. No, and, and thank you so much, Joni, for agreeing to host this. I really appreciate your effort and all you do for the organization. I just want to thank everybody for getting on this call and for everybody who supports as a member. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll we'll get you on the, our next webinar, which which should be in the next month or so. So hey thanks. guys, let's all give Nick and Rachel and Bill a big hand. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. It's um, appreciated. And uh, thank you all to be patient through a few technical difficulties. One of the hardest things is to be gifted in technology and then it doesn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> we all go through that. So um, thank you all and um, best of luck forward. And I look forward to seeing you all at hopefully an NSBA meeting or along the way. Take care. Before we leave, one thank last you. thing. We've got a few minutes left before 4.15. And I see Keith King is here. And maybe Keith wants to say a couple of words about his organization, because it can be extremely helpful for some of the members that's, that are on the call. Thank you, Bob. That's very nice of you. And again, Patrick and everyone. And I want to acknowledge the uh, other veterans on this call as well, Bill. Uh, you know, Bill Belknap has done a phenomenal job in where he came from and how far he's gotten. The thing that I always want to remind everyone about, and I, you know, and Bob, I loved your, your, your analogy of businesses are, are like children. Uh, I started my first one in 84. Um, I now have gone through three or yeah, three of them. And the last one <laughs> was the, the one that still is uh, at least in premise uh, operating. But what has happened is exactly what we're talking about. The children grow up and you need to lead that. You need to make sure that the direction they're headed in the sense of what we do um, is a certification what we try to make sure that we do and what we're available for is those who have gone through the startup. Those of you who are already up and running and are very known at, the, at, at this point, and you want to look at what markets you want to perform in. Much like Bill, I spent the first 14 years of my uh, company in federal contract. It is what prompted us to move over to the corporate side. And there's a, a program that corporations have that's called supplier diversity. We put the rationale together to get accepted and then the certification, which was a step two for them to actually begin issuing contracts. Um, I'm pleased to say that a group called the Billion Dollar Roundtable just put out their economic impact. They've spent over 3.3 billion with our certified vets, total economic impact in 22, the one year, uh, $6.7 billion. What that means to me is the corporations care. They wanna help veteran owned businesses and they've proven that. We've been running now 10 years. So again, I just wanna let you know that we're here as a service, as a door, if you will, that if you're ready to jump into, give me a holler. Can you give us your website a couple of times? Yeah, sure. Thank you again. It's uh, simply www.nvbdc, National Veteran Business Development Council. I'm used to doing that phonetically military-wise, but um, I'm still working through all that. But it's .org, so nvbdc.org, O-R-G. And you can probably see that over my shoulder here. Um, or you can call us at 888-CERTIFIED. Uh, that number is monitored and answered, hopefully, 24-7. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we are available to you to answer your questions. Uh, my certification team are veterans um, and are highly skilled at what we do. So 
Again, Bob, thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to join you as well. And again, good to see you, uh, Patrick and, and Ian. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, somebody asked me how long I've been a member. And I think we go back and look in the uh, roles. I've been a member about 15 years or so. <laughs> it just, uh, I think it was Patrick who said he want people to work, you know, and I keep popping in and out of here. So at least now I'm working again. So hopefully I'm some help to you all. But thank you. Thank you, Keith. Alrighty, everybody. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jody. Thank you, guys.